great investments. He said, great investments don't need spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. We're Compound Everything, and today we are talking about Manesh Pabrai and the search for the hundred bagger the hundred, or multi bagger. The multi bagger. Yeah. So he gave a lecture to a group of students, uh, and so we're gonna do our um, little synopsis or summary of uh, what we took away from mm -hmm. his interview with this uh, management. Yeah, and I think class. what drew us to this one is that it was the title of the. Of the lecture, yes. the search for the I can't remember what it's called, but something like the search for the, the multi bagger or something like that. Yeah. Of course, you're interested as soon as you see multi bagger and maybe. Manesh Pabrai talking about and it. Manesh Pabrai talking about it being a value yeah. guy who has an excellent um, track record. Yeah, and uh, he made several good points, but a few really stuck out to us, mm -hmm. and we want to talk about those today. Yeah, so he actually talked about different styles of value investing. For sure, so, that was I thought that was really interesting actually. Yeah. So he had I think it was six or seven of them. Yeah. And so, I mean, you can kind of intertwine some of them, but these were these were his, um, uh, the ones that he had talked mm -hmm. about. So there's discounts, which is buying 50 cent dollars. So and that is what the traditional view of value investing was. From Ben Graham and right. whatnot, so, they're going around trying to find a, you know, a dollar trading for 50 cents right. so or when, less. Yeah, so you know. when people say I'm a value investor, that's probably, instantly what they think of right but there are many different ways to value invest but that's For historically sure. the way people yeah. think of value yeah. investing so buying 50 cent dollars that's yeah, 50 one cent dollars, yeah. so the other one is spin-offs mm -hmm. so spin-offs um being like when companies spin off another mm -hmm. part of their business uh sometimes they do that to unlock shareholder value yeah. for either the remaining business or the business that spun yeah. off because... and joel greenblatt made a lot of his money from a spin-off. He did, yeah. Initially, yeah. and Seth Klarman also loves spin-offs. Yes, and so you can find those companies that are spinning off if you go through, um, you know, things like Wall Street Journal and stuff like that, they're not hard to find. Yeah. Uh, a bit of a tangent. But mm -hmm. uh, the other one was cannibals. Now, yeah. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, so what's a cannibal? So a cannibal- well, We know what a cannibal is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is a cannibal So investing? a cannib in cannibal and value investing is a company that is aggressively buying back shares. Yeah. So a few of them that are doing that now is one is a Warren Buffett play, which is Hewlett Packard. Mm -hmm. They've been aggressively buying back shares. Mm -hmm. Lowe's mm -hmm. is another one. Actually, if you go back mm -hmm. uh, over the past 10 years or so, they've been very aggressively buying back shares. And he had mentioned that the most recent shareholder meeting, um, I think how, um, or was that a while back? I can't remember. He had mentioned how um, their ownership in uh, American Express had doubled because of uh, uh, buybacks. Warren Buffett did, yes. not Monash. Sorry, not Monash. Sorry, yeah. my apologies. Yeah. But um, Warren Buffett had mentioned that his position Amex mm -hmm. proportionally had almost doubled because of mm -hmm. Amex aggressively buying back shares over the years. Yeah. So that's a cannibal. Yeah, and we had talked about Lowe's before. Yes. And if you had looked at how many shares they bought back over the yeah. past decade yeah. that you've really increased your ownership in the company huge just because the yeah. company itself was buying back their own shares yeah. so that's called a cannibal that's a cannibal a cannibal company so after cannibals we have spawners spawner so what is a spawner so a spawner is a business um where where in the business itself creates new divisions or, or whatnot or it gets into new businesses and then later spins those off to shareholders spawns them off. yes or spawns them off <laughs> yeah I found that one a little harder to think of an example of. I, yeah, that, I also I, I found it a little more difficult because oftentimes when companies spin off, it's not because they're necessarily a company known for spin offs, it's because they're trying to unlock cash right. or unlock value. Yeah. So the point yeah. being is, I, I, it's not that I don't disbelieve that's a, that would be yeah. a category, I but I, I have yet to find an example. And I, yeah. So that's well, a, that's a I spawner. I couldn't understand the difference between a spin off and a spawner. And maybe there's a lot of overlap there. And maybe he was just saying if you didn't realize that he had said one and not the other. For sure. Or I don't, we just I, missed something. Maybe we just missed the boat on that one. But yeah. but uh, he had said another one is spawner. So yeah. the fifth one is special situations. Oh, I have a PE of one. Oh, okay. Well, okay, we'll let's, do, to... let's do yours first. Okay. So special situations are things that happen in a business where in maybe it's a, a takeover. Mm -hmm. So a, a, an example right now is uh, ATBI. Mm -hmm. uh, or Activision Blizzard, which is being bought out by Microsoft. So they're trading at a discount to the proposed purchase price by uh, by Microsoft. As of today, it was Quite trading around discount. 80 bucks. Yeah. And um, I believe Microsoft's going to buy it out at 95. Yeah. And so 
depending on the time that goes through, you can make a decent return mm -hmm. just by buying the underlying shares and then selling them when it gets bought out. Yeah. So that's a special example of a special situation. Yeah. And there's others, of course, but yeah, or um, to keep it brief. Tender offers. Tender offers is another one. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. So they. That's a, actually a good point. So tender offers. Um, you like to do. I like tender, tender offers. And yeah. That's what made me think of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the point being is, um, uh, with tender offers, they they can be another source of value. Uh, yeah. Uh, a special situation. Yeah. 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 Um, so the other one was um, PEs of one. Yeah. So I thought this was interesting, and he had sent in another lecture. He looks for for businesses that have a PE of one or a future I've PE of one. I've heard him mention P of one in at least three or four different um, lectures, lectures that he's right. done. So this must be one type of value investing that he loves to do. I think so. Because he talks about it often. Yeah. And he also, he talks about the PE of one too because he says sometimes they just, you find them and they have a PE one. And sometimes you have to extrapolate that. Yeah. Do a little digging and looking to the accounting. Yeah. yeah. Which becomes a little more difficult. For sure. So the thing to remember these categories, these are Manish's categories. And so everyone made categories and a little different, but we just thought it was interesting that he had a, uh, a different take on value investing mm -hmm. and value investing. Warren Buffett has said, uh, value and growth mm -hmm. are tied at the hip. Mm -hmm. And so that brings me to my, mm -hmm. or, or his last point, which is, uh, multi-bankers. Right. Which he says, direct quote, the best approach to value investing is focusing on the multi-bagger. Right. That's what he said in that. And there's a few reasons for that. Mm -hmm. So one is you don't have to go look for another opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it just keeps growing and growing mm -hmm. and growing and um, you just sit on it. Yep. You can be a lazy investor <laughs> if you Which buy the right company. Which he claims to be. <laughs> right. So he's been quoted as saying when asked how much time he takes to invest or how much effort, I think he says a half a person right? or something like that. I so, think, or his wife answered right. or said that or something. Yeah. So he's a lazy investor. So he likes to be a lazy investor. Yeah. Who doesn't like to be a lazy yeah, investor? Yeah, exactly. So the point being is you don't have to find another um, investment. So with traditional value investing, you buy your 50 cent dollars, it gets you know, priced back to what is an appropriate value and you sell it and you go move on. Right. But with multi-baggers, you just sit and ride it. Mm -hmm. So with Amazon, if you had bought it and you know, the early 2000s and you just sat on it, you'd need to do nothing else. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, that's the, the uh, nirvana, I guess yeah. is what he would say. Which is why he says it's the best. Right. Nirvana. So that's that. The other thing is it's a tax haven. Mm -hmm. So whenever you buy and sell a stock, you're going to trigger either capital gains or, or some sort of a taxable event. And so by just sitting and holding these shares, you defer tax as long as you can. Right. So that yet another reason to look for multi-baggers. Right. So he actually gives a way in which you can find multi-baggers mm -hmm. or what to look for, what makes a company a multi-bagger. Yes. And one of the things just off the, just at the beginning, um, he said, oftentimes like everyone wants these multi-baggers. And once mm -hmm. we go into the three, I think he calls them the three legs of yeah. finding a multi-bagger, yeah. uh, because of that, these companies are often priced to perfection. Yes. So he does say you're probably going to have to pay a premium price right. for these companies. Because they're a, good companies, they're, everyone knows it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But because um, you're holding it for so long, that's okay. Now you right. still have to kind of find them at the right time. Right. But even by the time you can identify them with the three legs, they're already going to be priced. I think he says they're already priced to perfection. Right. Yeah. And so I, I think um, he would also advocate being patient, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to pay for it when it's egregiously overpriced. Right, exactly. Um, and whatnot. But uh, he says just kind of hold on through thick and thin. So right. what are those three points? He he kind of paraphrases Chuck Ackley, mm -hmm. who's another famous investor worth looking into um, right. if you're interested. But yeah. what are those three, stool, the three points yeah. on the stool? Yeah, so a high return on invested capital. Yeah. Um, and preferably no debt. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. Uh, great management. Yep. He always talks about management. And I always find that a little bit of a tough one because it's really difficult to actually identify great management right. when you don't have the opportunity to talk to the management. Right. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you do that? As, so that, as a that's private a, investor. That's, that's a hard. tough one. And I can't quite remember the third unless I go to my notes. A long runway. Yes. A long a runway. A long runway. Because yeah. you need a lot. Multi-baggers don't happen overnight. They don't happen over a year. They happen over decades. Right. That's generally, unless you get lucky. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And so he had mentioned uh, those as being three important pillars to, mm -hmm. to find a um, multi-bagger stock. Mm -hmm. And I would actually add a fourth. 
Okay. So maybe them being a little presumptuous and doing so. No, that makes sense because we're not as smart as Manesh. Right. So we need more guidance right. down the path of finding a multi-bagger. Yes. So the fourth one I would add is they do something different right. or they're innovators. Right. So um, he used the example of McDonald's. Mm -hmm. He said M McDonald's was probably about a 10,000 bagger since right. inception. So mm -hmm. every dollar invested in McDonald's at inception is about $10,000 mm -hmm. now, which is unreal. Right. But you had time to get in and to use those three points. Yeah. Right, and to watch them at, and, at and many that, times. At many times and yeah. still get 100 yeah, yeah. bagger or 10 bagger. Right, or five bagger. Yeah. Whatever, right? So, I mean, even these wonderful businesses will have periods where they either may fall in favor or the whole market um, declines and whatnot. And so um, with that, there's always opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why add a fourth? Mm -hmm. So why well, add he a kind of He kind of had added, he didn't say it when he was doing his bullet, like no. his three bullet points, but um, he did say that because at one time he talked about Coke and he said the other thing that multi-baggers have to have is that their moat is getting stronger. That's what right. he said. Yeah. And so to me, that would kind of be what your fourth is. Like they have to do something different. Right, they have your to do something different. Your moat's not going to get stronger if you're not doing something different. Well, even using McDonald's as an example, he said that they were doing something different. People have been eating mm -hmm. since people were around, mm -hmm. right? But they did it different. What did they do? Well, they made it universal. So if you went to McDonald's in Canada or you went to McDonald's in you know, uh, Hong Kong, the food tastes right. the same. Well, that's what you said. You, right. When you went to Hong Kong, when I went to Hong Kong, McDonald's, the McDonald's tasted. tasted like McDonald's. Yeah. There's no different. Mm -hmm. um, everything could be eaten without a knife and fork. Yeah, that was something that was very different so at that was, time. Something was very different at the time. And then the other thing was it was fast. Yeah. It was fast food. Mm -hmm. So those three things were innovations in mm -hmm. food service industry. Yeah. And then you think of Amazon. Amazon was. Mm -hmm. And has been undoubtedly a multi-bagger. Well, people have been buying and selling in marketplaces forever. Yeah. Yeah. They just did it online and they delivered to your door. Right. Um, think of other ones. So I once mean, they do it, so that's kind of your point that they have to do something different. His point is once they do it different, yeah. they have to be competitive. Yeah. And they have to keep that strong competitive advantage. Yes. And that's why he says he's actually very skeptical when trying to find multi-baggers mm. because once you become that type of company that can be a multi-bagger, the competition comes in. Fierce. Fierce. Yeah. And yeah. so you have to be able to fight off the competition. That moat has to be really large. Yes. Really um, protective. Right. Of, and, and, and extending mm -hmm. over time. So and getting stronger. Getting stronger. Yeah. yeah. So those are the three or arguably four yeah, points four of, points. of um, finding a multi-bagger. Multi yeah. So to circle back, you had talked about the tax advantage of having multi-baggers. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other advantages that he talks about is that you're not on a constant treadmill of selling and buying, selling and mm -hmm. buying, because like you said, yeah. it's the lazy investing way. You just buy this fantastic company, you sit back, right. patience is kind of key, yeah. and you let it run. Yeah. And then another um, advantage is that if you're buying, if you're doing the traditional buying 50 cent dollars, you are selling at some point. Yes. You're selling when it hits a dollar or hopefully it you know maybe it goes to dollar fifty exuberance takes over yeah. yeah and then it goes to dollar fifty but there yeah. is an exit point mm -hmm. and usually with fifty cent dollars I know Manesh says this and other investors have said that they like that to see that in three to five years. Yes. When they're doing um the more traditional value investing value approach. And he was saying with multi baggers you don't have to worry about like when do I get out? Do I get out at a dollar? Do I get out, you know, when the dollar's worth a dollar? Do I get out when the dollar's worth a dollar fifty? Right. You're not worrying about that because you're just letting it ride. Yeah. And and same thing through, through drawdowns. He mm -hmm. says you may have drawdowns of like 50, mm -hmm. 75, 90 percent sometimes. Right. And you just have to have the strength of conviction to hold if right. the business is worthwhile. Right. Um, he says don't sell unless it when it becomes overvalued, mm -hmm. you really only be tempted to sell when it becomes egregiously overvalued. Right, and then you intend to buy it back, but again, yeah, right. you, you're but there's no guarantees. Yeah. Yeah. And they, these are the type of companies, Buffett is always quoted as saying, the best time to sell is never. Right. Right, and we know that that's not true because Buffett um, sells all the time. Mm -hmm. But these are the type of companies that Buffett would be talking about as well when he says, you know, the best time, the best time to, to sell, sell is never. never. Yeah. 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 So the, um, along that point, his, the third point I took away was that um, great investments, he said, great investments don't need spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a big, long, complex spreadsheet in order to identify 
a great investment. Yeah, he said simplicity. Simplicity. Simplicity yeah. is the friend of the investor. Yeah. So what does that mean exactly? I'm, I'm not entirely sure how he would take it, but to me, it would ring that it should be so apparent that this is a, a value after you've done some digging mm -hmm. into the company, into its future potential, into its financials, that it's, it's a screaming buy. Yeah, and I think one of the things that people mix up is just because something is um, simple, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy. Right. Because he talks about, we've heard other lectures where he's talked about spending like just the sheer amount of time and combing over annual yeah. reports and going back 20 years. So um, simplicity doesn't mean fast. Right, it doesn't mean fast. It just means not complicated. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, yeah, you don't need to run it through several complex models right. and, and whatnot in but order he, to yeah. decide that, yes, it's a buy. But he's not rushing through, you know, one annual report. And right, it's not like he's looking at it for, you know, 20 minutes yeah. and pulling the trigger on it. He's, if you, when he was discussing his Tencent mm -hmm. uh, purchase, he had gone through every annual report. And then not only went through those, he also went to, and looked through NASPERS because annual were, reports because they were a large, the largest shareholder yeah. in Tencent. Yeah. So he does his homework. So just to recap, the yep. three legs of finding a multi-bagger, according to Manish Pabrai, yep. are... So a wonderful business, so mm -hmm. generating ret very high return equity, return invested capital. Mm -hmm. uh, one with great management, mm -hmm. so the management has to be honest and for the shareholders. Yeah. And uh, thirdly, they have to have a long potential runway. Yeah. So it has to be in an industry where it looks like they have nothing ahead of them in terms of obstacles. Yeah, exactly. And he says um, that if you were to take those three legs, and we've talked about this in previous videos, and inverse them, mm -hmm. right. then you can just throw those out. They don't even make it up. They don't even, you don't even need to worry about reading one sentence on their annual report right. because you've inversed those points. Right. And they failed and you yeah just so if the, if the runway looks poor then goes goes away Too if hard. the management looks shady harder to it, identify it, it gets pitched yeah you know and etc etc et yeah if they have high debt if they have high debt if they're not yeah. generating good returns and whatnot so yeah. th then those dis those businesses get tossed yeah. yeah so after he had kind of touched on those three points a little bit and the different styles of value investing which i actually thought was super interesting because mm -hmm. I knew that different value investors did things differently, but it was it was um, nice to hear him break it down into types. We well, almost feel like a heretic if you don't stick to the fifty, cent, book, do <laughs> to say 50 cent dollars. dollars. And maybe some value yeah. investors would consider right. you a heretic. But you, if you know don't. you're a value investor, <laughs> right? Right. But you're like, but I'm not buying fifty cent dollars. So it was nice to hear his. Right. Um, and and also, he has said that he was very sloppy. When he first he did started, say that. he said, I was very sloppy. And he said, one of the reasons was because he was jumping around into in and out, out, out of all those different types of value investing. Mm. He needed to find what type of, not even what type of investing, but like break it down even smaller. Like what type of value investing was mm. good for him. Yeah. And, and, and I so would also argue where, where does the opportunity come? Right. So maybe, right. maybe the 50 cent dollars have dried up right. and maybe you need to look elsewhere. Right. Maybe so that's it just depends. and that's probably where he got cannibals right. from. Because... And I mean, Warren Buffett does the same thing. I mean, mm -hmm. he's he's bought into ATVI. That's mm -hmm. clearly a special situation. Mm -hmm. He's bought into Hewlett Packard, which is mm -hmm. clearly cannibalizing. Yeah. So I mean, he does it too. Yeah, exactly. So, so. that was really a really fantastic uh, and small portion of that yeah. lecture. Yeah, just a little takeaway point. He had talked about valuations, mm -hmm. um, just of different asset classes. So he compared the real estate market to the stock market mm -hmm. so and he said uh in the stock market if you look at the stock market oftentimes if you compare and you can take you know many given stocks and you can look at their 52 week high you can look at their 52 week low and they'll fluctuate by as much as 50 100 maybe sometimes as much as 200 mm percent -hmm. so from the the high to the to the low and so at, at that point he, he he says there's no way that the business itself the value of the business fluctuates that much, yeah. right? And it's just because the the stock market is an auction format mm -hmm. that it fluctuates so much. Mm -hmm. And he compared it to the housing market. Right. And he said, because you have an informed buyer and you have an informed seller, the price fluctuation in the housing market is often very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe that goes a little out the window these days. Um, 
with housing prices having inflated so high and but generally I think it holds true. Mm -hmm. So and he gave the example of a real estate agent friend. So if you call your real estate agent friend and he says, well, what's my, uh, you know, my house worth? And he says, well, it's worth about 300,000. Right. And you, you call him a month from now and he says, well, yeah, it's still worth about 300,000. Exactly. And he, you call him to, you know, again another mm -hmm. month from then and he's like, man, we quit calling me, it's worth <laughs> still 300,000. You call him six months from then and he's like, fine, it's worth 305,000, mm -hmm. you know? And, it, it, it's not like it's going to be worth 300000 you know, at one time and then 450000 right. you know, in two later. months from now or whatever, you know, yeah. a week later. And then worth, you know, $200,000, you know, a few months after yeah. that. But stocks will do that. Exactly. Because they're an auction format. Yeah. And when he said the auction format, we've used the housing example before and a lot of people have used it. Yeah. But because he said the word auction, like we've been to car auctions before. Yes. And auctions have a very unique environment yes and people get caught up like yeah. we've watched people get caught up in like way overbid mm -hmm. for a car and we've also watched um on quieter days at the auction we've watched really great cars go for, go for peanuts peanuts yeah. right and so as soon as he said auction i was like he's right like the stock market is like an auction and unless you've been to an auction it's just a completely different environment yeah. being at a auction than it is going to see a house walking in going back to see it again it's slower taking some time the, to think the about pace it pace is different and that really because you're not in an auction house mm. for most traders or for most retail people like we're in you know we're not on on the on wall street yeah right or anywhere we're in our living room yeah you don't think of it as an auction but it really it really is, is it an really auction. moves like there's an auctioneer yes um you know yeah screaming out numbers constantly that's yeah. right there is opportunity to find whatever you're looking for oftentimes in the stock market just for that reason right. that it's an auction format and that's where you can find the value and that's where you can find and the value. that's where you yep. can find multi baggers even after they've already proven themselves mm -hmm. and you know everyone wants them once in a while a great company will plummet down to the depths yeah of the earth and you can pick up you know a, a fantastic company for a good price and yeah. sit back and let it run and uh, uh, Manesh quoted Templeton saying you only have to be right according to John Templeton John Templeton he said one third of the time and you'll do just fine mm -hmm, and then Manesh himself said if you're right 50% of the time oh. doing multi baggers he said if you're trying to find multi baggers and you only get half of them right oh, you'll have a spectacular he said right? you'll he said that's enough to yeah. um, do really well for yeah. yourself you know multi baggers and you know growth stocks can be part of a value investing strategy mm -hmm. according to Manish Pabrai, mm -hmm. which is which is an interesting thought yeah and growth and value are tied at the hip and growth and value are tied at the hip yeah so i think that pretty much i think that pretty much lecture. wraps mm -hmm. up the lecture I, if you have any um questions comments we we always like to hear them yeah and you can like and subscribe because that really helps our channel that's right and we will see you guys next week